Kejimakujik National Park was established in 1969 to preserve the area's old-growth forest, rare wildlife, and waterways, which had been occupied by Mi'kmaq peoples for thousands of years. In 1995, Kejimakujik became Canada's first national park to be designated a National Historic Site, in no small part in recognition of the site's many petroglyphs, more than 500 of which have been identified within the park. According to Parks Canada, generations of families have paddled, hiked, camped, and connected with nature and Mi'kmaq culture at Kejimakujik National Park and National Historic Site. Rock engravings known as petroglyphs traditional encampment sites, and canoe routes attest to the presence of Mi'kmaq people for thousands of years. Today on Historian Astra, we're paddling around Kejimakujik National Park and Historic Site in southwestern Nova Scotia on the traditional and present territory of the Mi'kmaq and considering how national parks teach history. The Mi'kmaq divided their territory into seven districts. The southwestern portion of Nova Scotia was known as Gespuichik, or Land Ends. Traces of Mi'kmaq inhabitation of Kejimakujik stretch back between three and five thousand years. As Donna Morris, a recently retired Mi'kmaq interpreter at Kejimakujik, explained in a 2019 interview, the cultural landscape here within Kejimakujik Park and National Historic Site is significant to the Mi'kmaq people in this area because in the early 1800s and way before, like 5,000 years ago, there were Mi'kmaq people that had lived in this area. Most of this area is protected now, so there's a lot of First Nations people that can come and visit the site that their ancestors or their direct family had once lived. And they had open access to the park. And the petroglyphs is a reminder of people in the past that had once lived here a long time ago. And also, Archaeological sites within Kejimakujik National Park, National Historic Site, also pertain to the landscape of the Mi'kmaq people. Fishing weirs, fishing sites, hunting sites, encampment sites, and habitation sites, all within this particular area. Resources from Donna Morris and other Mi'kmaq educators provide great insight into Kejimakujik's history, links in the description, but don't necessarily explain how this history is taught on site. To better understand how teaching history is approached at national parks, I spoke to two experts. I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm Jessica DeWitt. I am an historian of the Canadian and the U.S. environment. Um, I do comparative history of the two, and I focus on parks. Um, my particular specialty are provincial parks and state parks, so the level below national parks, but also. But I also know a lot about national parks, and I am uh, an independent scholar, uh, editor, um, digital strategies uh, person, um, and I my main affiliation is the Network in Canadian History and Environment, where I am a editor and executive member. Yeah. Uh, okay, so hi, uh, my name is Liz, Liz Edwards. Um, I am currently a master's student at the University of Western Ontario in the public history program. Uh, I've actually worked with Parks Canada for the last eight summer seasons um, at a national historic site and a national park as well. Um, and my research uh, and interest is around Indigenous history and uh, specifically Indigenous aspects of conservation, both heritage and natural conservation in national parks. For some, the historical value of visiting a site like Kejimakujik might not be immediately obvious because national parks are usually presented as sites for recreational activities or to immerse oneself in untouched nature. But that's not the whole picture, as Liz explains. Just like with historic sites, I do think that a lot of parks um, are places, historic places. Um, for example, what we'll be talking about today with Kejimikujik, but also my park I work at, which is Georgian Bay Islands National Park. Um, both of them are actually national historic sites as well as national parks. What I've seen is a lot of their hiking routes and their canoe routes are actually the traditional routes that the Mi'kmaq would use. So it's really cool to get to kind of participate in history in that way and get to see it. National parks are great places of historic significance and one of the best ways to learn about the history of Canada is to be in a landscape that is 
preserved historically that has things like petroglyphs and traditional trade routes and it's so cool to be immersed in that it's similar to going to a historic house that you know was converted back to the victorian era and walking through and feeling transported i think that there is so much opportunity to be able to transport be transported into history in natural spaces i think it's just as immersive as any other historic site experience but, as Dr. DeWitt says, there's a pretty clear reason that Kejimikujik became Canada's first national park to be designated a national historic site. What really stuck out to me was that there's so much emphasis on the petroglyphs, right? And to me, that is because it's easy for settlers to understand. It's um, a more tangible uh, artifact, piece of heritage, and we can kind of latch on to that, right? in a way that other Indigenous heritage and Indigenous histories and stories aren't quite as um, easy to understand. The petroglyphs can be made into something that is visitable. So if we're thinking about settlers and settlers visiting parks, the petroglyphs are something that we can, we can um, interpret and clearly bring settlers to, to look at. <laughs> Hey, look, it's indigenous culture. It, it exists, has existed for a long time. Um, and it's not as easy with other parks where there's, those things don't exist or they don't exist in the same, the same way. So because we visited during the COVID-19 pandemic, interpreters and the programs offered were very limited and the visitor center was closed. The petroglyphs and burial grounds can only be visited on guided tours, in part to help protect them from vandalism, so we were not able to see them while at Kejimikujik. We also weren't able to participate in programs such as traditional Mi'kmaq birch bark canoe building with the contractor Todd Labrador, or visit the Mi'kmaq encampment site used by interpreters to share about Mi'kmaq culture. The petroglyphs found around Kejimikujik are thought to have been carved between the 17th and 19th centuries. Many depict images of hunting, fishing, or gatherings, and some depict Mi'kmaq encounters with Europeans. While the petroglyphs provide an obvious historical value to this region, the context from which the site was created is also important to understanding why Kejimikujik was made a park and heritage site. Heritage sites, historical heritage, national heritage sites, um, are very similar to national parks. And both of them represent the national consciousness at the time that they are created and formed. For instance, during the First World War, there was just an inordinate amount of military and war sites that were made into national historic sites. Because that, at that time, that's what the Canadian populace and the Canadian politicians were clinging to, right? Um, so with national parks, that's more about what our ideas of nature are at that time. So like, Alan McEachern has talked about how um, when Canada started making parks in Atlantic Canada, they kind of had to restructure their definition of nature because um, they weren't quote unquote wilderness like the parks in the West, like your Banff, your Jasper. Um, they weren't the same quality of landscape. Um, there are still indigenous people living on it, and there's, there were settlers that had already moved in. I think that's the most important part. There are already settlers that are living in these spaces. So we had to rework our, our definitions of nature to include people um, in Atlantic Canada. So I don't think it's like, I think that's also an important thing to think about when we're thinking about Kepikudik. Um But with historic heritage spaces, it's more about um, what we think of our history to be. What what parts of our history do we want to, do we deem important enough to make into a national um, historic site? The act of creating national parks is usually thought of in terms of conservation efforts, but another element of this history is that creating national parks is an act of colonialism. So creating a park is um, a colonial process. It is um, based on a settler conception of land ownership um, by creating these artificial lines around a piece of land we are um, determining what behavior is and activity is okay within those parts and 
for determining who is able to do certain activities? One of my favorite Indigenous scholars, uh, she's also a writer and a poet, Leanne Simpson. She talks about national parks as nationalism parks. And um, that's something I strongly, I do strongly believe in. I think the way that Parks Canada kind of does things is legitimizes a claim that this this specific area is very important ecologically and culturally therefore it must be protected but indigenous people who whose lands are traditionally there whether they're on them or not um seem to not be fit enough to be able to to do this so rather than giving them the area and being like okay continue to practice your culture and your stewardship we have to take it over as kind of this like settler paternalism um and and make it all nice and and do whatever else so we can legitimize because of course the whole mandate of parks as a whole is um to preserve canada for all to help build our nation and to help other people who come to canada see this is what canada is we are pristine nature and wilderness and what that does is it removes so much of the culture and the history and the violence that is taking place there and instead these areas just become totally timeless a historical places um, where you know it's all about the nature. Parks are very regulated spaces. Um, the park making process is a regulatory process, and this regulatory process is determined by settler governments. So, um, when thinking about the partnerships or cooperation that the federal government has with the people in regards to this park. Um, we also have to think about um, whether the Indigenous peoples are being able to shape this um, this relationship, um, the, the laws and the regulations that they are, or if they are being invited into a colonial structure. Um, and oftentimes, it's the latter. While Parks Canada now works with Mi'kmaq communities in part by staffing Mi'kmaq interpreters and contractors, and seeks to foster traditional knowledge transfer and public engagement at Kechimakujik and in Mi'kmaq communities. This hasn't always been the case. The very creation of Kechimakujik Park was protested by some Mi'kmaq activists who argued that the park included reserve lands that had not been properly surrendered. For most of the park's history, Mi'kmaq activists and advocates have been asking for greater representation and agency at Kechimakujik. Parks Canada has worked in the past few decades to collaborate with more Indigenous communities at their parks and heritage sites. While Indigenous collaboration is important and a move in the right direction, both Dr. DeWitt and Liz think we could do more in the spirit of reconciliation and to fulfill Parks Canada's own goal to enable Indigenous peoples to fulfill their roles as traditional stewards of lands and waters within heritage places, maintaining the reciprocal relationships that have existed for millennia. I'm, I might get in slack for this, but I hope not. But GBI does this is, hey, local, um, so both slave First Nation is our local indigenous community that um, that both the island is their, their land. Um, they always ask them their drum circles or whoever else come to the island and do a drum circle and let us take pictures and let us post it on Facebook and let us tokenize you um, to seem so much more progressive and inclusive, when in reality we have cultural advisory circles that the whole point is to work with Indigenous people and to be constantly in conversation about what is happening in the park and what we're doing. Instead, what it is is um, the occasional meeting and hey, how's everyone doing? This is what we're gonna. This is what we're gonna be doing this month. Okay, bye. You don't get a say. You don't get to be included in the planning process or even the speculation prior to solidifying these plans about what is happening with their land and their resources. I think the number one, the number one um, thing that needs to be considered when we're looking at co-management is kind of the hierarchy of co-management, um, that it needs to be indigenous led. Um, it needs, but I also think that co-management should also be not to, not to the extent of like, so I think that Indigenous people should also very, like, if that community wants that, if they want to co-manage and it's, and they are the ones proposing or at least like really trying to make an effort, that should be done. I don't think that we should be 
forcing co-management on certain communities if it's not something that they would be interested in. Um, so I think that co-management should always be, it should be led by Indigenous people. Um, so for parks, that would be as the government kind of just approaching and saying, look, we have this land, these resources, it's yours. What do you want to do with it? How can we best support you? Whether it's just coming in and harvesting medicine and plants and animals, whether it's creating an entire interpretation center, whether it's allowing you to practice sweat lodges, allowing you to practice um, other traditional, um, traditional cultural practices. Um, so yeah, I think that the biggest thing for co-management, but also it's important not to be paternalistic about it and to just be like, oh, it's so great. You can come and pick plants and whatever else. Also allowing them to be leading um, the main ecological and um, resource conservation efforts is also really important. My cynical side <laughs> in regards to parks that are um, have a higher Indigenous presence or have invited more Indigenous folks in, this is changing, but my cynical side is always that it's much easier to do this in the north where settlers don't go. <laughs> uh, it's easy to say, hey, you can have control of this park because, you know, it's thousands of kilometers north and only the most wealthy are going to fly up here every summer, you know. Um, it's, it's much more difficult to, be, to make these, um, to create these relationships in places like Banff where um, the government is making a lot of money <laughs> off of tourism and off of um, non-Indigenous land uses, right? So there is more, as we as we go along, there is more participation with Indigenous groups, like Nakota, like the Dakota having a role in the reintroduction of bison or bear, for instance. Um, but it's still less than, and I think that we should be critical of that. You can only have a truly decolonial park if the indigenous people are given the land back and have full control. Otherwise, you're just inviting them in to play a part in structures that are determined by colonial governments. And I think if we can just give land back and see what happens, like that is the best that we can do. Um, but parks, obviously, there's so much money tied up in it. There's so many, so much politics tied up in it that it's, it's hard, I guess, to just surrender a site. But um, it would be nice if we could focus less on, here's a list of things we want Indigenous people to do for us as a park, and rather just being, at least listening, being open and saying, what do you need from us? How can we best serve you as a community and as a people? A primary way Indigenous peoples are represented at national parks like Ketchumacujic is as interpreters or guides. And to be clear, Nothing I've read suggests that people like Donna Morris have felt tokenized or abused by Parks Canada. To the contrary, interviews with these women suggest that they feel their work with Parks Canada is or was fulfilling. However, Liz and Dr. DeWitt both recognize that most Parks interpreters are settlers, and this presents some challenges. Uh, I think it's problematic, and this is something that I struggle with as an interpreter who is a white settler, um, that and a lot of interpreters, you know, are maybe not white, but but we're settlers. Um, it's really hard to you want to tell the stories that the indigenous people had about this about that specific spot um, because it's what people a lot of people come to see. Um, but there's also people who come with their own kind of expectations. For example, on Beausoleil, the big historic site is the cemetery. And so many people will walk up to me and be like, oh, I heard there was an Indian burial ground. Oh, well, can we go see, you know? And so it's, it, it's hard because you don't want to sensationalize these sites, but also when we go and visit these sites with white interpreters telling Indigenous stories where it's not really our place to tell. Um, I think it's really problematic, um, but it's, yeah, interpretation at Parks Canada is very much, um, it's very formulaic. They want things to be educational. In national parks, a lot of it has to do with um, more of the resources and ecological side of things. Um, how many species of turtles do we have? What kind of bird is that? Um, looking at different kinds of trees, that kind of thing. So often we don't get to tell history 
or we get these very minute little like oh here's a petroglyph blah 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 and those stories told by white settlers i think that they enforce this kind of um this kind of ideology that indigenous people are are disappearing or gone or ancient and we don't get to frame them in the context of the park today so i think if we could have indigenous interpreters uh, i know a lot of sites do we have a, an indigenous knowledge keeper sean who does a lot of uh our interpreting uh, interpreting as well and where i've learned all my my knowledge from when i'm doing guided tours um but yeah i think it's really important that we that we're able to include Indigenous voices more. I don't think it's our place to co-opt these stories and kind of sensationalize them in a way so we, we can make money. Um, but what you kind of talked about earlier, like the emotional labor um, of having to be a representative for all of the Mi'kmaq culture, or all of the Anishinaabe culture. Um, and I, I have a few friends that I worked with at the park who were Indigenous who felt that too felt that emotional labor that Parks was constantly calling upon them to speak for all of Indigenous people. Well, I, I do think that, first of all, having Indigenous interpreters is an excellent move. Um, and that um, I'm not going to, I think that they, letting them having have free reign over how they interpret it to for visitors is really important. So not um, telling them what to say for sentences, um, and letting them, because they do have the knowledge of the land and letting them, and they also know what they want to share and what they don't want to share. Um, so that's, that's really important. And, um, I think as a settler historian, I don't want to like comment more on that or say, you know, prescriptive, like, oh, they should be doing this or that. I just think that we, that that's an important step just to um, give over control of that to Indigenous interpreters. Um, but if we're talking about settler interpreters who are in that space, then they definitely need to be learning from Indigenous people. They definitely need to know both the natural and the history of the, of the space. I think that goes for any national park. Um, but <laughs> interpreters are often underpaid summer employees and um, we can't <laughs> expect people to um, have a career's worth of knowledge right um, for their summer job and that's kind of just a, a I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing that this is who is the, often the interpreters in the spaces. Um, it's just kind of a reality, right? Yeah, I guess I'm saying is that, yes, you, you need to know this knowledge, but also we have to be realistic about um, the limitations of how these um, historic sites are often run. And perhaps that goes into a, a, a conversation of how we should change the way that a lot of these spaces are, are, are run. The history of national parks is complicated and challenges the ways in which visitors experience history at heritage sites like Kejimakujik. But these are inherently historic sites. The experience of being in Kejimakujik may not align with conventional ideas about teaching history, but by existing in this space, visitors knowingly or unknowingly are participating in Mi'kmaq history. Um, and so it's really important that we do have national parks, not only just so we have some piece of, you know, authentic nature left, but to be able to have spaces where people can come and not only reminisce about the past, but reflect on your present and hopefully take that with you. Um, yeah. As a park historian, uh, knowing the feeling of stepping in a certain landscape, um, even if it has changed drastically since the park was established, um, it, it allows me to empathize with the people that I'm writing about, um, to picture what they pictured. Um, and I don't think we talk about that enough, um, as a story, because we're so, you know, we're so, um, bent on archival documents, right? standing in a beautiful space and kind of feeling that and feeling the, the air on them, feeling, listening to the water is so valuable. Um, and kind of takes these, these, these spaces out of the abstract and into 
reality, right? It kind of makes them jump off the page. Mi'kmaq history is present on the landscape, not only in the petroglyphs to be found in certain areas of the park, but also on the water, along the trails, and among the park's plants and animals. As Jean Augustine McIsaac, who was head of cultural and historic interpretation at Kejimikuchik before she passed in 2011 said, walking with the same secluded pathways as the ancestors, breathing the same rich forest air, taking in the silence that is broken only by the sounds of nature, it is impossible not to feel a sense of reverence for this place. So whether you are driving in the park, hiking our trails, or canoeing our waters, remember that the ancestors were here long before us and left their imprint upon this land. As you pass through, do so with the same respect as the Mi'kmaq people who came this way before you. In that way, Keshmakujik will remain a special place for every one of us, where we can come and touch the past, in the present, for the future. For this is where our records are, the journal of our voyage through time, our history written in stone. History in Austria is created, written, and produced by Aaron Isaac. Special thanks to Jessica DeWitt and Liz Edwards for speaking with me, and to Graham Christie for camera and canoe support. Our theme music is by Broke for Free. You can learn more at brokeforfree.bandcamp.com. And you're listening to Stories in the Stone by Jean Augustine McIsaac and Dan Crowfeather McIsaac. Pictures tell when strangers first arrive.